Good afternoon, everyone. Here we are. Hello? Is it audible? Is it okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andrzej Klimesh uh, from the Oriental Institute of the Czech Academy of Sciences, and uh, I welcome everyone at our conference uh, on Xinjiang or East Turkestan, which is a part of larger series uh, related to the situation in the Uyghur homeland, which are uh, taking place in Prague throughout uh, two weeks. Uh, throughout this week and the following week, uh, tomorrow international conference organized by the World Uyghur Congress is starting in uh, Hotel Grand Dior. And uh, uh, I would like to first invite uh, for a few words uh, director of uh, the Goethe Institute who was uh, so kind um, to grant us a venue for this uh, conference because it was organized uh, sort of at the very last moment. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Sonja Grigoshevsky, and I'm the director here in Prague at the Goethe Institute. And uh, I don't know how much you know about the Goethe Institute, but we are uh, the worldwide German cultural organization uh, with many branches, about uh, 160. And we are also based in Beijing, for example. Uh, so um, there's a little connection here. And um, the Goethe Institute, where well, we teach German language um, here uh, in Prague, but at many other places. But we also do a lot of cultural and educational programs. And um, civil society, human rights, and so on are also very important for us. So I wish you a very uh, successful conference. And I also want to say just two sentences about this beautiful building for the people who are actually here today, not online. Um, because this uh, building has a very interesting history as well. It was built in 1905 as a, for a Czech bank. That's why it is so very luxurious and, and very kind of impressive. <laughs> um, and in 1959, uh, the embassy for the uh, German Democratic Republic moved in and uh, was in this building for more than 40 years. And after the German uh, reunification, the Goethe Institute moved in. So now we are here for more than 30 years, which is great. It's a very beautiful building and we love to have guests here. Normally we have that more often, but with COVID now, um, it's a bit difficult. But uh, I wish you a very well, uh, a very interesting, very fruitful uh, conference. And thank you for being here and uh, all the best. very much. I think it's a very symbolic uh, place, the two, the e former East German embassy serving as a floor for cultural venues and events. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to invite our first speaker, which is Professor Joseph Pitti uh, from uh, Newcastle University. Uh, second, uh, Professor Ryan Tam from Manchester University. And third speaker is uh, Professor Adrian Zenz from uh, Victimus Communism Memorial. Uh, so the format of this event is that first we will listen to the presentations, about 20 to 25 minutes each, then we will take a small coffee break and come back for the discussion after the break. So, uh, so
thank you China very much um, for that honour. Um, so this field trip is, is really my, my last window into exactly what was happening on, on the ground. So, so yes, if you went into the Xinhua bookstore in 2018, you found absolutely no books at all teaching Uyghur to young children um, or teaching Uyghur script. So, for example, there was just one box of Uyghur phonetics flashcards in Uyghur script, which, were, which was battered and bashed and obviously been there for a long time, was the sort of last remaining vestige of, of that kind of um, teaching material. On the other hand, there was a very large stand of books aimed at, at um, Han Chinese speakers, encouraging them to learn Uyghur. This was very interesting. They, they didn't want Uyghur children to learn Uyghur, but they did want Han settlers in the region to learn to learn Uyghur. Uh, and this was packaged as, as a sort of way of for, uh, for, forging ethnic unity between between the ethnic groups. The bookseller, uh, who I had a very quiet conversation with in the corner of the shop, had other ideas. However. She said to me, Han studying Uyghur since 2017 um, are not learning Uyghur as a mark of cultural respect. They are learning Uyghur so that they can better understand what we are saying and what we are planning to do. So as another form of, if you like, civilian surveillance. Um, and there were only three books in the shop that taught English to Uyghur adults. So clearly, um, again, the state not wanting Uyghur um, citizens to have access to, to English um, teaching and learning materials, not wanting with us just to be able to communicate with uh, English speakers outside of the region. Um, I took this picture of a, a fabric banner outside the number one Urumqi primary school, which has been much circulated um, since, which shows, you see the black rectangle here, this shows the Uyghur uh, modified Arabic script having been cut out, literally cut out. If you zoom in, you can see the, the frayed fabric around the edges, um, literally cut out from this banner um, because of its association with Islam. And this is, was taking place alongside a simultaneous erasure of, of online documents, uh, Chinese, author, Chinese um, government documents about bilingual education. So whereas uh, since 2004, we had heard much speak of bilingual education, Zhuang Yu, Diao Yu, um, from around 2017 onwards um, and consistent with the publication of the de-extremification regulations. We see instead Guoyu uh, Jiaoyu documents that talk about national language policy, which means Chinese only education, Chinese medium education only. Don't need to do that. So I'm going to show you a clip. Um, I, I had a two-hour conversation with this very charming boy in Kashgar in, in 2018. Um, and let's just find it. Actually, I'm going to show you a slightly different clip. As I have one clip of him singing China's national, national song. I'm going to show you a slightly different one, which is um, one of him singing a song that children learn in primary school to help them remember the four tones uh, in, in Chinese. to do with the sound. Oh, this is the national song. This is him singing China's national song. Okay, so that was just um, just to give you a sense of how Uyghur children are increasingly not able to sing songs in Uyghur, which I, I saw in many places in 2018, um, but are increasingly very very able to, to speak and, and sing songs in in, uh, in Chinese, in Mandarin Chinese. So. So I want to focus in on this set of um, six textbooks. The textbook is called Til Adabiyat, uh, Language and Literature. 
um, and it was a revised set, a revised edition for 2018. Um, and what we found when we analysed the textbooks was that most of the texts had been adopted uh, and translate, uh, adapted and translated from the corresponding Chinese medium set. So they had been basically taken readings from the Chinese language version and they had translated those into Uyghur but with some important differences. What we found was that even though there were Uyghur characteristics found in the Chinese medium textbooks which were aimed at Chinese children, all of those Uyghur characteristics were taken out of the version that was then aimed at the Uyghur children. So completely stripped of um, Uyghur uh, cultural and religious references. So you might ask why, why do they bother having a Uyghur medium version of the textbook at all? You know, if they, if they want to stop Uyghur children speaking Chinese. Well, obviously you can't just immediately um, switch from Uyghur to Chinese and, and expect Uyghur small children uh, to be able to cope with that. So our, our, our sense of this is that this is a kind of linguistic transition, almost like a coerced linguistic transition between the previous policy of bilingual education and the new era policy of national language education. So if the CCP's goal is to indoctrinate young Uyghur children with the idea that they are, they are Chinese, they are integral to the Chinese nation, um, they have no separate culture, they have no separate belief system, they are just like any other Chinese person, then they still need to use the Uyghur language to, to get that message through, at least for now, because you, know, you, can't, just, you can't just jump straight from, from Uyghur to Chinese. That said, so, so um, what I was hearing in 2018 was that most Uyghur children were only getting three hours of Uyghur medium education a week at school, and the Uyghur was taught as a second language during those hours. Um, that said, in some places it appeared, according to research by our colleague Hannah Burdorf in 2019, again field, field research on the ground, it appeared that in some places those three hours weren't even being taught either. So Uyghur medium education had completely vanished. So there were some inconsistencies across, across the region. So I, we carried out some interviews with two exiled Uyghur scholars. Um, the first one with Kamal Turk Yeltun, who is the son of the imprisoned textbook compiler Yeltun Rose. So this is what he had to say. You know, what, what will happen to the children under these conditions, we asked. Well, Uyghur will become kind of like their second language, and they'll become less and less comfortable to speak in Uyghur. And this will pull them away from their cultural environment, make them less inclined to communicate with their parents, with their relatives. And they'll become more pulled towards the Chinese population, the Han population. Speaking Uyghur will become troublesome because they're not comfortable to speak it. It will hurt their ethnic pride. They will kind of feel that being Uyghur and speaking Uyghur is a kind of burden. It's kind of accelerating the speed of cultural genocide, so that within one or two generations, no one will like to call themselves a Uyghur. <clears throat> so what were our findings about these textbooks? What had happened? What had been done to these textbooks? Well, um, all the way through the six books, Han Chinese culture and social life are emphasized. Confucian and secular culture and, and social life. Uyghur cultural and social life, Turkic Islamic practices completely absent, almost completely absent. You don't see the word Islam once all the way through the six books. You only see the, the ethnonym Uyghur twice, and that's in the name of the region, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. So that was our first finding. The second finding is that where you have pictures of human characters in the books, you see only hand facial features, uh, hand, hand facial characteristics and cultural dress. And the Uyghur features and cultural dress are absent, almost completely absent. There's one exception, which I'll show you in a minute, which is quite an interesting exception. So for example, in this picture, you see the Chinese emperor surrounded by Chinese children wearing traditional Chinese costume. And Uyghur children are expected to embrace this as their culture and their history and their tradition. Um, but there's one exception, there's this very interesting case with book six, sorry, book two, book 
book two, level six, where on the front of the book, we have the picture on the right, which shows, um, as in all of the other six books, pictures of typically Han Chinese children, the typical Han, you know, a typical Han pigtails on the girls, and, and the, you know, the pioneer ties, the red pioneer ties, um, shallow set eyes, uh, and so on. Clearly Han, Han children, uh, Asian, East Asian children. Um, but when you, as you flick through the book, and there is only one incidence of this, you find this, this picture on the left, on page 95, which is clearly the same picture before it was doctored. This is the same picture before it was doctored. So um, we think, we, we hypothesise, we can only hypothesise that this was left in by accident because we don't think the people who compiled, the Uyghur editors who compiled this series of books would have dared to leave it in on purpose. We think it was left in by mistake, but we cannot be absolutely sure, of course. We can't, we can't interview the editors um, who are still at large in the, in, in the region. And of course in that picture you see um, multiple braids, long braids on the Uyghur girl on the left. Um, and we see the, the deep set eyes, uh, typical of, um, of the more sort of porcoid look of, of the Uyghur people. So Kamal Turk Yalkun um, commented on this, this, this discrepancy and said um, he, th he thought there were not many brave people left in, in the region who would dare to leave the picture in by um, deliberately. He said, I think that's like been left over. It's been left in. Uh, and he actually knows one of the, 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 the main editor of this series, uh, Dilshad Kokor. Uh, he said, he's not someone to do such brave acts. He's quite afraid of getting into trouble. And he's afraid to the point of becoming complicit. He just wanted to be safe. Here's an example of intimidation and self-censorship coming from, coming from uh, state intimidation and the fear that arises from intimidation. So finding three, we found that Uyghur personal names are almost completely erased. They do not appear, appear at all in the readings. They do appear uh, occasionally in the practice drills, and the practice drills, by the way, are usually written by a different author. So this may indicate there's a higher level of bravery amongst the person who wrote the drills. We, we can't be sure. But in any case, the, the few Uyghur names that do appear in the drills are always ones that are safe, considered safe. So they're ones that don't have any um, Arabic or, or Islamic associations. <clears throat> Our fourth finding is that the, the regional geographical characteristics of, of the Uyghur region are, have been completely erased, even though some of those appear in the original Chinese medium version. They have been taken out of the version that is shown to the Uyghur children. So instead, what we see are all these uh, geographical characteristics typical of inner China. We see monkeys. You know, when, did, when did you ever see a monkey in Xinjiang? I didn't see one in Xinjiang yet. We see monkeys, we see fish, we see lakes, we see rainy days, you know, vegetables and, and fruits that are normally found in China proper, like flowering quince. Um, and we don't see snows, oases, sands, deserts, fruits. Uh, like melons and grapes and walnuts, or even pomegranates. This is surprising because pomegranate is a favourite symbol at the moment of the Chinese Communist Party, who always like to say that all of the Chinese uh, ethnic groups are like seed, pomegranate seeds and the pomegranate all bound tightly together. But we don't see those in this textbook. Okay. So um, findings five, six, seven, I'll deal with together because they're all, they all relate to literature. So what we find in these textbook series is that Han Chinese and foreign Western literatures are highlighted, but not Turkish or Middle Eastern or any kind of Islamic literatures, notably. Uh, but Uyghur literature and folklore are almost completely gone, taken out again. Folk stories, same story, all coming from Han Chinese sources. Uyghur folk stories, not there. Uh, and the poems, I mean, we know what a, what a rich, a vast richness we have of Uyghur poems. We know, thanks to Josh, Joshua Freeman, who is busy trans translating these, these beautiful pieces of work um, furiously and, 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 and making them known to the English-speaking world. Um, but nothing, none of these beautiful poems appear in these books, all gone. Uh, all we, what we see is Han Chinese poems translated into Uyghur. You can see a picture here, this one's taken from the water margin. Um, and this is all song, killing, killing a man-eating tiger. Um, so, Kamal Turk, 
in his interview said, we can say that the order from the authorities has been to eliminate entirely the Uyghur content from these books and to eliminate that content to a bare minimum. At this point, he said, it's like a blatant order to wipe out everything Uyghur and that fits with the Chinese objectives. Um, it's like China gave the, the compilers these objectives and the compilers themselves were too scared to do anything other than um, erase these aspects to the point where they actually reached, reached the state objectives and completely cleaned, completely cleansed these, these textbooks. Um, so yeah, there is corroborating field data also from my, my um, PhD student, my colleague Hannah Berdorf, um, who was in, who was in the region in 2019 and inter interviewed a respondent, a respondent in Urumqi who uh, confirmed um, in my brother's Chinese literary primary school textbook they only have texts about Chinese things like panda bears but when I was in elementary school 10 years earlier we learned about Uyghur things like the production of naan bread. So again confirming that that change, that alteration, that shift over time. When I was little we learned about Uyghur writers but now this is not possible. Why? Because most of the writers and the cultural figures are in internment camps. They don't appear in the school books anymore. So yeah, just to quickly sum up those findings, we, these are our conclusions. Um, these erasures embody the state's deliberate intention, we would argue, to invisibilize and eventually to eradicate the Uyghur people as such, as in meaning as they are now, right? as a separate ethnic group nation culture. Um, they are also trying to invisibilize Xinjiang place as a separate homeland with unique or distinct characteristics. They want the region to look exactly like the rest of China as far as possible. Of course they're busy constructing Chinese real estate with, you know, with, the, with the typical um, roofs of, of Chinese homes and uh, pagodas, pagodas appearing on islands in the middle of Xinjiang lakes uh, and you know, trying to sort of reconstruct the sort of Chinese Disneyland almost in the, in, in the region. And I think the message here is that it's not possible now for Uyghurs to bypass Han China as they were doing right up until 2016, you know, and connecting with culturally sympathetic Turkey and Central Asian and Arab worlds. Just not possible to do that now. Uyghurs now have to interact with the outside world as loyal, assimilated members of the Han majoritarian Chinese state. This is the only possible identity open to them. Um, and they are not any more able to uh, interact with um, Turkic, Central Asian or Arab um, neighbours. So, Kamal Tuk sums this up uh, in saying, the state has been paranoid, as all totalitarian governments tend to be. China doesn't tolerate diversity. They only want uniformity for their subjects. They are paranoid that diversity could lead to independence, an independence movement or something like that. But actually, the oppression of diversity, the oppression of culture, would lead people to have a stronger will to not convert. And we heard this yesterday from Omir Bhattabhakali as well, at yesterday's event. I think they, the Chinese authorities, are very confident of their power to eliminate everything that's in their way. Okay. And again, we talked yesterday about the Belt and Road Initiative as well. Now the Uyghurs are simply sitting in, in an area um, in the northwest of China where they are getting right and physically in the way of, of China's ambitions to expand out into the world via, via the, the old Silk Road routes. We also interviewed Abdugali Ayyub. Um, Abdugali Ayyub had this to say. What they're receiving, uh, Abdugali Ayyub, in case you don't know, is a language rights campaigner. He was in, formerly imprisoned in Xinjiang for um, for having the audacity to raise money to open a Uyghur medium kindergarten. Um, this was not received well by the authorities uh, and he was imprisoned and later tortured. Uh, and there's some quite grueling um, evidence uh, in, in, in the public domain about that. So he said to us, what they are receiving is not Chinese education, it's Chinese political education, Chinese cultural education and, Chinese, uh, and Confucian education. They want to make Uyghurs more Chinese than even Chinese. They want to make Uyghurs more communist than even Han Chinese communists. This is a politicized education, a cultural assimilationist education, an education that prioritizes ideas and not scientific knowledge. 
and he went on to to lament that this is going to harm Uyghur children's mentality. Uh, and you know, we can think here about the uh, Article Two B uh, of the um, UN Convention on Genocide, in which it states that um, one one of the acts that is tantamount to genocide is, is causing physical or mental harm to to an ethnic group. So he he, he says they are. You know, this kind of education will make them fed up with knowledge. They're being asked to memorize things, writings from Confucian times. Even Han adults, Han Chinese adults, cannot understand these things. Um, and he complained about them being taught things like, you know, Nanzun Liu Bei, uh, men, are, men are superior, women are inferior. You know, saying, you know, this is, this is an outdated thinking. You know, we're living in a time where people are advocating the equality of male and female, uh, and so on and so on. I fear them transforming Uyghur children into abnormal people with oppressed minds more than I fear them turning them simply into Han Chinese. But he's saying this is not even a normal Han Chinese education. This is an ideological, specifically targeted education uh, uh, for Uyghurs. <clears throat> yeah, so he concludes that 900,000 people, and these are the children who've been separated from their parents and, and sent off to boarding schools uh, and so on. 900,000 people uh, with psychological problems are growing up right now in, in the region. So is this a crime against humanity? Yes, according to the Global Centre uh, for religious and cultural persecution, and I think what we've described here um, fits into that category. But is it genocide? And of course, this is the big question that everyone is wrangling over for the last year now, and it's currently being debated by the, the Weaver Tribunal in, in London. So, in my view, um, and uh, in the essay that I co-wrote with Andre Klimesh here, we, we, we believe that what is happening in Xinjiang to language, religion and culture is plainly genocide in the way in which it is described by Raphael Lemkin in the broader sense. Uh, um, Raphael Lemkin, of course, saw cultural destruction as just as important as physical annihilation. Um, and uh, he saw genocide as the, essential, the destruction of the essential foundations of the life of national groups as such, as they are now, uh, but not necessarily involving or requiring mass killing. So, uh, yeah. So, so, yeah, so we see kind of colonial reflections here as well um, with colonialism in other parts of the world. So I'm just going to talk about two very quickly before I stop. Um, so the erasures in the textbooks and the religious landscape, which I my colleague is about to talk about, uh, Ryan here, um, and the demographic removals, which possibly you talk about, yeah, which Adrian will talk about in a minute. All of these erasures, these are all different kinds of types of erasures, um, and uh, I would suggest that these are reminiscent of erasures in, in several historical settler colonies that we could look at, uh, and in cases of frontier genocide. One of those cases is Namibia, the Germans in Namibia, German colonists, where the German colonists enacted policies of tabula rasa, okay, so creating a map scraped clean, you know, cleaning all, all sort of vestiges of, of Uyghur culture and religion from the landscape, from the textbooks, from, from the people's practices. Yeah? Um, and uh, in order to do that, the, the German colonists had to sort of dehumanize the local people in order to, to uh, achieve this. And another potential, skip that one, another potential comparison, is, uh, which I think is very compelling, and I'd like to do more research on, is, is colonial Algeria. And there are many, many par parallels here. So um, I would refer to Malek Manabi, uh, the Algerian social philosopher, who talked about how a country could be either simply conquered and occupied, or truly colonized. So the Uyghurs previously, until recently, were simply, simply conquered and occupied. Um, but uh, now, more recently, the PRC government is using various coercive measures to forcibly assimilate them. 
And this roughly corresponds also to what Sean Roberts has been writing about this transition from a frontier economy to a settler economy yeah. in his book, um, The War on the Weavers from, from last year. Um, and I'd refer also to Franz Fanon, who wrote about black skin and white masks. So the way in which um, Algerian black colonial subjects um, donned the white mask of the French language in order to navigate French dominated social spaces. Now weavers have been trying to do this since the mid 1990s, trying in good faith to don the, 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 the Chinese, the Mandarin Chinese linguistic mask to, 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 to kind of uh, navigate uh, Chinese spaces. It didn't get them anywhere. However well they learned Chinese, however, however much they adopted Chinese Han Chinese practices, they were still not accepted as Chinese. This, this is so, yeah, so Uyghurs fluent in Chinese, like the French-speaking Algerians before them, suffered racism and, and exclusion even after donning that mask. And now, of course, the white mask is being forcibly imposed in, in Xinjiang. Uh, and here we'll be talking about the Chinese language and culture. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Also very important to Uyghur cultural heritage. I forgot to introduce uh, Jo's work. She has worked a lot on Uyghur society, uh, doing a lot of field research, working with informants on topics of culture and everyday life. So perhaps this is something we can discuss later. Uh, thank you. Uh, or uh, please, Ryan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for coming. I forgot to thank everyone for coming here. <laughs> and this uh, cheery time. kinds of issues when we have uh, roughly a million or maybe more people put into uh, internment camps based on the basis of their ethnicity. We have a very successful campaign by the Chinese state of um, uh, uh, forced birth control and forced sterilization to reduce the portion of Uyghurs in, in the region. We have the um, forced separation of children from taken out of their Uyghur families' homes and raised in um, state orphanages and state uh, residential uh, residential schools. Um, many hundreds of thousands of people put in uh, prison with long sentences uh, for activities which were uh, not considered illegal at the time they uh, undertook them or which are, uh, which are trumped up. Um, in light of all of this, it, it can seem a little bit minor, I think, to talk about uh, these cultural issues. but. These are issues that are really um, at the forefront of a lot of Uyghurs' minds. Um, I've just come from uh, Istanbul, where um, this was a lot. What a lot of people are 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 really talking about and concerned about is the the possibility that if they ever do manage to safely return to their homeland, that it it the, the homeland they know won't be there, and the ethnic group of which they're a part will cease to exist in a, in a, uh, in any meaningful. Way. 
um, one sample a conversation in which this came up was I was talking to a Uyghur friend and we were sort of talking not not pointedly about this issue but about uh, um, how people how culture changes over generations and I mentioned that um, uh, I'm of German descent and that my grandparents spoke German my parents don't and, uh, uh, and then my generation also does not he said you know for my children I would be happy with that that, that would be fine for me if my children grew up not speaking and speaking only Turkish, except that my culture is being erased uh, um, back home. And for that reason, I desperately need my children to, to, to learn Uyghur and to speak Uyghur so that they can um, carry, carry on the culture. So, um, so I proceed then with the knowledge that, you know, being confined to an internment camp is, is probably of a higher order. And um, uh, Dr. Zenz will talk about that at, at length. Um, but I think these cultural, these issues of cultural erasure are also uh, quite important to uh, those Uyghurs who are fortunate enough right now not to be in, um, in, in the prison or, or in an internment camp. So I'll specifically talk about, I'm going to aim at one kind of cultural institution, which is the shrine, uh, partly because it's received proportionally less attention than some of the other cultural destruction that um, uh, Uyghurs have received. Excuse me. Um, if you have been following the news about the Uyghurs, you're likely to have seen reports about the destruction of mosques. Uh, many thousands of mosques have been uh, destroyed by the Chinese state. Um, this gets a lot more attention than the destruction of shrines, and I'll talk momentarily about what exactly I mean by uh, a shrine. And I think that's largely because um, people outside the region are unfamiliar with shrines, so it just it's more meaningful to non-Uyghur audiences to discuss uh, to discuss mosques. So let me just start with an example. Um, so this is an image of the shrine of uh, Imam Jafar Sadiq. Uh, some of you may recognize that name as one of the Shia 12 Imams. He's not considered a Shia saint by the Uyghurs, he, uh, although he's historically known to be buried, I think, oh, shoot, is it in, um, is it in the Hejaz or is it in Iraq, I forgot, but not here. But he's, they believe him to be buried here um, in that uh, that white structure up on the top of the hill, which is actually quite large. I didn't take many pictures when I went because I was being, I was running away from a government minder and didn't want to <laughs> make myself too known by bringing out a, a camera. Um, so this is probably, I would say, one of the three or four most important holy places um, in the uh, in the in the Uyghur homeland. And in 2018, over the course of um, just a few days, it was it was completely removed from the landscape. Now this is very far away from any major settlement. This is just this is just desert. So um, whoever did this, which is presumably uh, state authorities, um, did it simply to destroy what was there, not to not for to use the land. You can't farm on this. It's Very little likelihood of any kind of um, economic development that's going to be um, going to be happening here. Okay, so what what is this? Is, and this is one of several. Uh, in fact, most, pretty much all of the most important ones have either been shrines have either been destroyed or have been turned into uh, kind of museums. But uh, more of them destroyed than uh, than museumified. So a shrine is in Uyghur, in the Uyghur language is called a mazar, and this is any place of kind of inherent holiness. In most cases, it's a, it's a point on the landscape, a point, uh, you know, a point on the earth. In most cases, it, it has become holy by virtue of some historical event that happened there. Most frequently, it, a, a saint has died there, a, a holy person, often somebody who was uh, considered responsible for bringing um, Islam to, uh, to, the, to the Uyghurs. But it can be other things too, like sacred springs or sacred trees. Usually, it's the grave. Uh, usually, it's the grave of the saint, and it can take a really astonishingly wide range of um, physical uh, manifestations. So, you can have, for example, this one, the tomb of Apa Koja, which is a very magnificent uh, 16th or 17th century construction, glazed tiles, and a dome, um, or 
this one, which is near uh, near Hotan, another sort of large uh, permanent brick structure. Uh, but there are also uh, more ephemeral kinds of uh, markers of, of the shrine. Uh, this is a pretty common type of shrine in the region of Hotan, uh, where you have these fences with, with uh, flags planted. The flags are usually brought by uh, brought by pilgrims. Here's, here's another uh, shrine. And these flags brought by the pilgrims kind of give the place its meaning, not just for, not simply by marking it, but when you attend there as a pilgrim yourself, you know that each one of those flags represents another pilgrim who came before you. And so you, you can see, even, even when the place is empty, and often they're quite crowded, but even when it's empty, you can see the presence of, of the other pilgrims who are sharing your uh, beliefs with you, and also they degrade over time, so you can kind of see the chronological layers of people uh, coming to venerate these, uh, coming to venerate these places. Um, at certain times of years, the, the year the large shrines have um, enormous gatherings. Uh, well, had these are all forbidden, uh, forbidden now, um, where people would come from all over, all over the region in the in the thousands, and. You know, the sort of stereotypical thing that people are there to do is to uh, make prayers to, to the saint who's thought to be able to hear them, who's thought to be there spiritually and exists, and be able to intercede on your behalf as a pilgrim um, uh, with God. But there are all kinds of other roles that the shrines play. So when people gather, they create a, a, a big uh, market, market appears, um, and this is considered a form of entertainment to go on a shrine, uh, go on a pilgrimage to a shrine. And just see all the lovely sweets that are for sale. Um, children ride on swings. Uh, there are tightrope performers sometimes. Uh, so this is also a, a, a form of entertainment. It's also a place where people learn about the history of their own uh, of their own culture and society. So here's an image of um, a group of musicians who sing historical tales, uh, and this. Uh, as of 100 or 200 years ago, was one of the primary ways that people who we now call Uyghurs would learn what it meant to be a Uyghur, what what their uh, what their past uh, was uh, was all about. And then it's also a place of um, has a kind of medical role as well. So people will go and pray at the shrine to get healing, or um, uh, women who want to give birth to a son will perform um, certain uh, certain uh, rituals. The last thing I want to say about the nature of the Mazar is to distinguish its its um, its kind of sanctity from a mosque. And one of the reasons that I really want to emphasize the destruction of the, the, the uh, destruction of shrines over the destruction of mosques is, th is that the shrines have a much greater physical sacredness to them. So one of the practices you see at, at, sh at shrine gatherings is that people will rub their face against the wall of the shrine because the wall the shrine itself has holiness or um, women who um, uh, have certain wishes regarding birth will stick their uh, hand into a crack in, in a wall or a hole in the dirt and, and grab a, a little and, and, uh, and swallow it. So it has its own sort of physical uh, a presence in a way a mosque does it's not. A mosque I think it's probably better thought of as a clean purified place where you can where you can pray but you wouldn't you wouldn't expect say a piece of the mosque's wall to have its own kind of inherent sacredness and that inherent physical sacredness is part of what makes the destruction of these places um, so devastating uh, so devastating for people so let me give you just a little bit of an update of, uh, of which some of the places that have been destroyed or um, desecrated this is the shrine of Imam Asim. You can see a before picture I took in 2013. And then this is a picture from TripAdvisor of someone who went out there uh, as a tourist and saw that the all of the pilgrims' offices and offerings and fences and sort of things that uh, give it its apparent sacredness uh, have, been, uh, have been removed. And um, unfortunately, uh, the Ordam Pacha complex, which you see here, which has been forbidden for Uyghurs to visit for uh, two decades anyway, um, this, using Google Maps, um, we can see has also uh, also been destroyed. Um, 
this is another case where you're talking about uh, the nearest cultivated land is 14 kilometers away. So there's really no purpose in destroying this, except that you actually want it to be gone. Now, why would that matter if for 20 years it has been illegal for Uyghurs to visit the place? It matters because the existence of these shrines still has a power for people, even if they cannot um, approach them. Uh, so, for example, one of my um, uh, colleagues who ha has to work anonymously um, actually managed to slip um, through the security and visit uh, Ordan Pacha once. Um, and when she showed up the next town and told people she'd been there, they collected the dust from her um, from her jacket um, as a kind of uh, sacred. Uh, well, they asked her, "Can we collect it?" Collect it. So it was sacred. But not only that, I've seen people pray to the shrines from a distance. So um, this man was turned away when he tried to go to the first shrine I, I, I talked to you about, Jafar Sadi. Uh, he was turned away, uh, not allowed to approach even within, say, 20 kilometers. Um, and once he got out, sort of out of view of the police, uh, he stopped on the side of the road and prayed to the shrine anyway. So even if you can't get there, it still has power, uh, uh, a power for I mean, it's a little bit like when the, um, the Notre Dame, uh, Notre Dame Cathedral burned in Paris and, um, you know, people all over the world were kind of shocked and even depressed about the destruction of this building that they might not even in their lives ever, uh, ever be able uh, to, to, to see. Okay, so, so what's going on here? Um, this is, it both has its own logic, the destruction of shrines, which I'll talk about in a, in a Further on, and it um, and it's part of a larger project to completely reshape the terrain of the of the Uyghur homeland. Uh, the uh, sequence of images you see here is the destruction of a very old uh, graveyard. Hundreds of Uyghur graveyards throughout the region have been uh, destroyed, like uh, like this. This one's in the center of the city of uh, Hotan. This land is valuable and has a development a parking lot over part of it and um, a building development on the, on the, on the eastern side. Also uh, um, coinciding with this is the destruction of Uyghur, the Uyghur old cities. So uh, this is, uh, this image is a bit uh, small and difficult to see, but here's the old town of Khotan. Um, and as you move forward a few years, you can see there's some sort of gaps that have appeared. What they did was tear down buildings in small groups and rebuild kind of uh, Disneyland type uh, reproductions of them. And then for other parts, they really flattened large areas and replaced them with tall, uh, tall apartment uh, blocks. This is, Hotan is not the first place where this happened. Um, actually, long before this turn toward mass internment and the, the efforts to repress the, suppress the Uyghur population, et cetera, uh, already the most important um, of the preserved ancient cities of the region uh, have been destroyed. That, that is the city of Kashgar, um, which was destroyed piece by piece and then rebuilt with uh, tourist imitation of, uh, of the city. And here you can see a tourist, um, a bunch of Han tourists being driven in an electric cart through the city, which you now have to pay a ticket uh, to enter. Um, one of the interesting things about what they've done here is that if you ride on that cart through the city, you can see something that you never would have seen before, which is the ex what would be the interior of a Uyghur home is presented on the exterior. So the Uyghur urban architecture, the traditional or, or more old style um, Uyghur urban architecture is very plain on the outside um, and with very narrow roads. Then when you walk inside, you see these beautiful courtyards with elaborately carved columns. You see um, niches and shelves along the walls with people's you know, uh, highly valued ceramics, things like that. You see the hearth. You see, um, and what you're seeing here is called the supa, the raised platform. This happens in uh, Northern China as well, a raised platform with heating underneath uh, upon which the family sleeps. Everyone will sleep together on the same, um, same platform. The great irony of this is that while this supa kind of uh, uh, 
thing has been moved to the outside for Han tourists to consume, it is being attacked by the state in Beaker's actual home. So there is a massive project underway, and this has been written about. And that stands out for me in um, comparison to the rest of the policies that have been put in place in, in, uh, in Xinjiang or Eastern Turkestan because of its local specificity. So it used to be as of 2012, 2013, the state, local governments did all kinds of experiments on how to achieve the central government's goals. And they would have slightly different policies from one oasis to the next. Once you get to the internment phase around 2017, 2018, policies become very uniform. I mean, you can find exceptions, of course, but uh, to me it was having, you know, been watching it for 20 years, it was a quite stunning turn toward a, a, a level of, of um, uh, what's the right word I'm saying this, but consistency uh, across regions. So it's quite surprising to me to see that the Yarkant seems to be having its, maybe its own local policy uh, on, on uh, on, on the shrines. And I think that may partly be because the shrine destruction has um, quite deep roots and the Chinese state was already closing down shrines, already damaging some of the shrines. Um, as I said, Ordan Pacha was inaccessible for, uh, for 20 years. Here you can see a shrine a photo I took in 2008 of a uh, building in a shrine that had been uh, closed down. So it may be that some of this is the sort of extension of uh, previous policies. Also, the touristification of, of, of Uyghur culture had been going on for quite a while, too. This is a tourist site that was built, I think, around 2013 or 14, which ironically takes elements of Uyghur shrines, the tying of uh, ribbons and cloth onto sacred trees, built it there. This is a big uh, concrete tree. Um, and this is, so this is for uh, Han tourists to visit. So essentially what's happening is the landscape is being turned into something that looks very much like the rest of, of China, tall apartment blocks, uh, villages are being destroyed, trees are being cut down, uh, people moved into sort of cookie cutter, uh, Levitt town type um, uh, houses for the Uyghurs, but then at the same time, replicas of what is being destroyed are being set up for the uh, consumption of uh, Han tourists. And this is all a great shame because the Chinese government had for a long time access to good information on what these shrines mean to um, Uyghurs. There's sort of two strains of Chinese government scholarship on shrines and Islam. One is um, a kind of fear of extremism, the, the, the pursuit of what they call de-Saudification, uh, fighting Saudi style. Um, influences. And of course, um, most um, Saudi ideologues would really hate these kinds of
anyway welcome uh, my sincere welcome to dr adrian dr or dr adrian Zen, sorry from uh, the victims of communism memorial foundation who has found a uh, kindly uh, free slot in his busy schedule adrian not uh, not needed to be introduced lately his work making a major impact who had uh, on on the discussion of uh, events in xinjiang or eastern turkestan and moreover who had previously done substantial work on tibetan issues so welcome adrian please the floor is yours well good afternoon thank you very much andre and uh, for inviting me to this event it's my pleasure to be here and to present um, and my topic will not be as tightly focused as the previous presentations i as uh, Andre indicated, I started out studying Tibetans and different aspects. And uh, my focus has been the study of Chinese government documents. And as a result, I have uh, studied uh, fairly different topics. I started out with ethnic minority education and employment, uh, which turned into research on police recruitment, and then on the uh, construction bits for internment camps, and then all kinds of other topics. So today I'm going to try to speak a little bit about Beijing's long-term strategy for the region and how it has been playing out. So in, to understand, we now have a bit of the context of this. So in 2014, Chinese President Xi Jinping visited the region. And this was also in the context of the ongoing sort of uh, acts of violent resistance. There had been a, a knife and knifing at the Kunming train station just uh, before that and a bomb attack, uh, at least it is alleged uh, at Tiananmen Square, a car bombing. And so some of the, the, the resistance exerted by Uyghurs was being carried outside of Xinjiang. There was also plenty of attacks happening in Xinjiang. And Xi Jinping said he called for a period of so-called painful interventionary treatment for the region to stamp out what he called religious extremism and, and, and radicalism and separatism. Um, which he said operates like a dangerous virus that infects people's mind, causing Uyghurs, quote, to lose their humanity and murder without blinking an eye. And it is really, it's almost like Xi Jinping gave the permission for an unfolding campaign or aspects of a campaign that unfolded and especially intensified in 2016 when the party secretary of Tibet, who had governed Tibet for five years, Chen Chuenguo, was then brought to Xinjiang, we believe, specifically to start this campaign of unprecedented internment and so on. So between 2014 and 16, we see there was a testing of different re-education, some of it in dedicated facilities, an increase of the police state, a setting up of surveillance. In early 2017, under Chen Chuenguo, we see the multiple rolling out of different aspects. And of course, the one thing that everybody talks about or knows about is the internment camps. But that's not the only thing that was rolled out with almost like a military style urgency and precision. Besides the internment campaign of rounding up Uyghurs, possibly over a million, we don't really know, uh, into re so-called re-education facilities, there was also an incredible drive to ramp up boarding schooling. There was an incredible drive to ramp up preschooling, the construction of preschools and herding weaker children from a young age into preschool, some of them full time, some of them overnight, some of them able to shelter even young children, regardless of their parents, which may in some instances both be in a camp. Um, we also saw a real ramping up of coercive poverty alleviation programs, which had existed before, but the labor training and transfer program, um, which in, in that as aspect is unrelated to the internment camps, saw a, a, a move to become more coercive and some of these vocational training schools, which were regular uh, vocational training facilities, um, became quite securitized, almost like camps, and people were put into them for like a short, shorter specific periods of time in order to then be assigned jobs. Um, this is what we saw in early 2017. Then 
in 2018, we saw almost like a second wave of campaigns in this atrocity. Notably, we had birth prevention, sterilization, insertion of intrauterine devices in women, and the, the drastic prosecution of birth prevention rolled out uh, starting early 2018 and since. Uh, we saw forced labor linked to the internment camps, meaning people have been in a vocational re-education camp and is being sort of quote unquote released into like a police guarded employment setting, often on a factory park, in the second half of 2018 and then subsequently in 2019. We also had then a targeting of intellectual elites, spiritual elites, and economic elites. You saw a picture of uh, Rahil Daoud, uh, a prominent Uyghur academic, uh, being swept up among these things into, in late 2017. Uh, and they're not being released. Many of them have been sentenced to long prison terms or they disappeared. We don't know uh, when or what uh, they're gonna come out. And we also saw, as we have heard, the reshaping of the landscape, uh, a destruction of traditional Uyghur neighborhoods. Even Fabian uh, Ryan presented one aspect of that on shrines. There's uh, a whole architectural um, destruction of entire traditional neighborhoods and rebuilding them, uh, destruction of mosques, destruction of shrines, etc. in 2018-19. Uh, within the forced labor, uh, that's a very big deal. Um, so, uh, so I, I want to talk about, well, so this has been moving on in phases, and um, this is obviously headed somewhere. So there's a Chinese academic report, uh, which was given to me by uh, an exile Uyghur lady. Uh, it was actually publicly available on the Nankai University website, and I've called it the Nankai Report, which was a Chinese research report published in uh, late 2018 the labor transfer program of Uyghurs, transferring Uyghurs to jobs uh, in other parts of Xinjiang, but especially in other parts of China, in Eastern China. And this report said that it was a necessary and effective, quote unquote, drastic short-term measure to place many Uyghurs into so-called education and training centers. A necessary and effective, drastic short-term measure. And, and Beijing itself, of course, claims that they have been the graduates of the so-called vocational centers, the, the re which is one type of re-education camp, have been released at the end of 2019. Um, we assume that an unknown number of people are still in various types of re-education facilities. Um, but many of these vocational camps uh, uh, on satellite, we actually see, have indeed been, been desecuritized and closed down that's being phased out at least partially. So the Nankai report by these Chinese academics says the long-term approach is focused on vocational skills training and poverty alleviation, especially through labor transfers. So we have now an unfolding of the long-term plan. Uh, as Ryan says, we have different developments. We saw this incredible internment campaign of rounding up people into internment camps. But now it's, it's moving on, and it's already moving into Beijing's long-term strategy. And of course, questions of genocide heavily uh, hinge on the question, well, what is going on now? What is the long-term plan? So there's different components to this. A very important aspect of this is forced labor uh, or coercive labor placements, very simply because that is a long-term solution. On the one hand, you have those who were in some of the vocational types of re-education camps, uh, where the goal always was to release people into forced labor, I believe. That was the goal of these facilities. There's other re-educational facilities that have no name vocational in them, in which I believe at least partially continue to operate. And um, we know very little about them. There hasn't been no further documentation on them. So those who are released from the vocational camps into forced labor, the focus there is on control. They're considered dangerous, and they're often made to be employed either in a tightly controlled factory park, some are sent home and are being uh, controlled by local government minders, and they're being uh, used into full-time factory work, uh, full-time year-round, often nearby home, 
uh, the scope we can only assume it's probably several hundred thousand. There was a uh, report on Kashgar in 2018 that mentioned the number 100,000. For that, that was early actually. So we are not sure how, how large the scope is. But the scope of the second forced labor scheme, the one that is linked to poverty alleviation through labor transfer, is much bigger. Uh, this scheme started actually in the early 2000s and took rural so-called agricultural surplus laborers who didn't really need to be employed in agriculture to transfer them to other sectors, such as the industrial sector or the service sector. And we, we can estimate that possibly up to 1.6 or 1.5 million uh, we, uh, ethnic minorities are at risk of forced labor. It's not a 100% uh, coercion quote. And these are also the ones that are being used to pick cotton, for example, pick cotton, pick tomatoes, harvest tomatoes, uh, be involved in agricultural harvesting and processing, uh, which affects us, global supply chains, right? Uh, and they are also the ones who are being transferred to other parts of China and might work in different companies across China, including ones that make lenses for Apple iPhone cameras and, and other electronics components and other products. The transfer itself constitutes potentially the, the crime against humanity of forcible transfer because the crime against humanity of forcible transfer defined by the International Criminal Court in The Hague as one of, one of the, there's several crimes against humanity. This one refers to re the removal of civilians from a place where they're lawfully present, meaning their home, without their consent. So what this does is it violates the protected interests and rights of people to live in their communities and their homes. Doesn't, it does not require actual force. The threat of possible physical or mental coercion or an overall coercive climate is sufficient for this, the, the determination of this crime. And um, another effect that these labor transfers have is they alter or optimize the population composition. They serve for the purpose of removing Uyghurs from an area where they're considered to be overly concentrated. In southern Xinjiang, you have millions of Uyghurs with a 90-95% share of Uyghurs. And this is considered a problem by the Chinese government. Um, one of the very important ongoing trends that we have been monitoring is the situation of the population, which I would like to unpack briefly before then giving a final outlook. So the most recent developments were that we, uh, researchers, including myself, found that in 2017 and 18, birth rates were declining dramatically in, in, in Xinjiang. Officially reported birth rates, especially in southern prefectures of Kashgar, Hotan, etc. And um, we initially thought this was caused by the internment camps, the internment campaign. But then um, I, we, I, I was digging a little bit deeper and found, no, actually, there was a systematic campaign to target women sterilize women, insert uh, intrauterine devices, um, and, 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 and different other ways to prevent somebody from being physically able to give birth. Um, in 2019, this continued. In a sample of 35 ethnic minority counties, the birth rate in 2019 declined by a further 50%. And this is already after we've seen dramatic declines in 2017-18. We also need to say that birth rates were among Uyghurs were among the highest in China. Uh, and they were allowed to have, legally they were allowed to have two, sometimes three kids, three kids if they were in the countryside. Now China of course has an official three child policy for everybody, but the Uyghurs are not benefiting from it. By comparison, 50% decline in birth rates. By comparison, 28 Han counties had a decline of only 20%. Xinjiang, you, you see declining birth rates among Han for various reasons, including, you know, choice. So uh, Xinjiang as a whole reported in 2019 a birth rate decline of 24%. The national China as a whole reported a decline of 4%. And you see the disproportionate declines in ethnic minority regions now, where does that come from? Um, 
some research I've conducted this year looks at something that I'm starting to call, following an inspiration by uh, Gardner Bovingdon, professor at Indiana University, uh, a term called a demographic engineering. And uh, Weiner and Teitelbaum, two researchers, in, uh, two academics in 2001, published a book where they wrote Demographic engineering entails the full range of government policies that are intended to affect the size, the composition, the distribution, and the growth rate of a population. So you have governments manipulating or engineering demographic variables to achieve security-related goals. And here it's a deliberate effort to shift the ethnic balance of an area. So the evidence shows that the Xinjiang's campaign to suppress birth rates is not just a temporary thing to adjust maybe their birth rate levels to the same level as that of the Han. Uh, in southern Xinjiang, uh, natural population growth is actually now lower than in the rest of the country. Um, it's to optimize the ethnic population structure. I'm borrowing here uh, from Chinese terminology. Chinese academics and politicians argue that Xinjiang's quote-unquote terrorism problem can only be achieved by optimizing the population structure. And that is you try to break up the population. The both government discourses and Chinese academic research discourses on counterterrorism and the situation in Xinjiang say there's three problems with the Uyghur population, population problem. Number one, the size of the Uyghur population is too high. Secondly, Uyghur population growth is too fast. And thirdly, the Uyghur population is too concentrated in one region, which increases, which creates threats to national security. To quote from Han Chinese counterterrorism researchers, they wrote in their research paper in order to completely eradicate terrorist crimes in Xinjiang, it's necessary to completely eradicate the soil, the growth conditions, and the environment in which terrorist mobs produce crimes. To do so, it is necessary to rationalize the population structure. Optimizing the proportions of the population and improving and enhancing the quality of the population, which is to solve the human problem is the foundation of solving Xinjiang's counterterrorism and other problems. Embedding the population is one of the simplest and most direct ways to solve the human problem. And then they speak about what embedding is. Embedding is about diluting the proportion of problem populations, which includes the poor, the unemployed, those who have a criminal history, and those of certain ethnic groups, which of course includes the, the, the weakest. Uh, and then you increase the proportion of the the good population, the Han Chinese, those who are less, those, those who are better off, better educated, and have no criminal history, according to the government. Another, uh, this is achieved by creating so-called mixed ethnic unity village villages, uh, where you have 50% Han in a village and 50% Uyghurs, and they have like alternate, one Uyghur house, one Han house, one Uyghur house, one Han house, and uh, you mix it up. According to government reports, these mixed ethnic unity villages eliminate hidden dangers caused by the overconcentration of one ethnic group, namely the Uyghurs. And another Chinese academic wrote in 2019, I'm quoting, according to a villager's cultural counterterrorism needs, he writes, the scope of the population with positive energy in the village should be expanded to 80 or 90 percent in a planned step-by-step -step and methodical manner and the scope of the population with negative energy in the village should be reduced to 7% or 3%, by like gradually converting them and changing them. And this whole embedding strategy requires, and, and virtually all of these researchers come up with one policy, one major, two major policy recommendations. The number one policy recommendation is uh, bring a lot of Han into southern Xinjiang to alter the population structure ethnic composition and um, decrease weaker birth rates. And I myself have calculated, and I don't have actually time to go into the calculation, but also 
uh, the, if, as you have seen also from Ryan's presentation, the ecological structure in southern Xinjiang is very fragile. You have a lot of desert. You have a shortage of water. Uh, you only have so much arable land. So uh, in order to not overburden the region's ecological carrying capacity, you, can, oh, you cannot take, say, 2 million Han and bring it to southern Xinjiang. It's, it's, it's impossible. The land cannot actually sustain it. So what I expect is a gradual increase in Han and a gradual decrease in Uyghurs through birth prevention, which could lead to a flat or slightly negative Uyghur population growth. Not enough by outside visitors to notice. So you don't, you're not going to see a disappearance of Uyghurs, and some people call this a slow genocide. And birth prevention is one of the five uh, criteria spelled out in the 1948 Convention on the Prevention of the Crime of Genocide. And um, if you crunch some numbers, it looks like it, it's possible that between two and a half and four and a half million Uyghurs will not be born between 2020, between 2018 and 2040 uh, by this policy in order to achieve these objectives. And the objective would be to increase the Han Chinese population sufficiently to achieve a significant embedding effect. So in conclusion, what is Beijing's long-term strategy in the region? In April 2017, I uh, used a term for the first time called social re-engineering or coercive social re-engineering. I think we have seen some of this in the presentations on education and on Uyghur religion and shrines about not wholesale destruction of a people, but, and I think this was expressed very well, uh, maybe by Joe, about the, uh, the assimilation. You know, what the Uyghurs uh, was, she interviewed were saying about what this would do. This would be like a loss of anything meaningful, uh, of a meaningful distinction uh, of what Uyghurs are, of markers of Uyghur identity, according to Raphael Lemkin, the father of the Genocide Convention. And the, first, the different aspects of that, so you have an unfolding genocide. And if there's a question, should we make a genocide determination or not? The purpose of the genocide convention that was constructed in 48 after World War II was to prevent another genocide from happening. Now it never has. The genocide prevention a convention has never prevented gen a genocide because governments have only ever a, 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 made a genocide determination after the fact, after the mass graves were. You could take a photo of a mass grave, right? But that's not the purpose. The, the genocide convention is actually there to, governments are supposed to determine the risk of a genocide about to occur or occurring in process. And if I was a government and I looked at this situation, I'd say, well, we have already evidence of birth prevention, dramatic declines. We already have evidence, we have some evidence of the intent to do this and the long-term strategy. I would say, um, the right thing to do is to determine there's a significant risk of a genocide happening or starting to happen uh, and unfolding in slow motion over the next generation, one or two generations. That I think would be the situation we are looking at here, uh, which is unconventional. It's not a classic mass graves, mass killing, um, but it's one of the ways which is being achieved. So in sum, the long term uh, approach or, or a situation that we have here is the internment and imprisonment campaign that the long-term effect of that even though if even if many Uyghurs have been released into forced labor many of the elite has been removed and removing the elite the intellectual economic and other elite is actually something you see in a lot of places where genocide has happened uh, you, you uh, governments go for an elite first and it's actually in the United Nations framework risk. The United Nations has published a risk indicator framework for uh, mass atrocity crimes, and the uh, attacks on an elite of a group is one of the uh, risk indicators. Second, parent-child separation. Children being reared in highly securitized boarding school environments where they must speak Chinese, cannot practice their religion, and are raised as loyal followers of the Communist Party. So it's about winning over the next generation. That's another pro. These are basically the things we started to see that happened in parallel with the internment campaign. Third, coercive labor, which is a, a long-term strategy. It places uh, Uyghurs in uh, new often newly constructed communities, 
promoting urbanization, living on factory complexes or nearby a factory, uh, often tearing apart families, the children go to boarding school, the parents work, uh, they might be separated even, the one person might, uh, the father might work here, uh, the other one, uh, there's a lot of separation going on. The party wants to take over as the parent. If you look at parent-child separation narratives, the party is the better parent than the weakest. Um, fourth, coupled with the dra uh, re drastic reduction in birth rates to slow minority population growth, uh, for the purposes of uh, diluting the human threat, as one academic put it, a population that grows quickly and rapidly is difficult to police. It's difficult to contain, difficult to control. A young generation that you constantly have new kids you need to win over and indoctrinate. Um, a, a drastically reduced population growth makes it much easier to police a, a population, to control it, to educate it the way you want to. And with the embedding. And then fifth, I would add China's aggressive pushback against Western sanctions, counter sanctions even, uh, threatening Western companies, boycotting Western companies that publicly say, like H&M in China, that publicly say uh, we Uyghur forced labor is a concern and we are pulling out of it on their website. And then the Chinese consumers boycotted them because this was a government strategy. And then H&M pulled the statement off their website. Uh, but still, they lost. Uh, they had a significant loss in, in China in, in their quarter. So it's a mass atrocity without a mass slaughter. And that gives us a great challenge. Recently, there was an article by an Associated Press on how the police, the visible police state is being drastically scaled back. Checkpoints are being removed. Uh, internment camps are being closed down, the ones in the cities. But high security facilities are expanding, but outside the cities. You see on satellite, you can't go there. Dancing and dress is everywhere. As James Leibold, an, uh, an academic on China's ethnic policy, has called it the museumification of Uyghur culture. And it's like a, it's it's also a little bit similar when I wrote um, my book about the Tibetans in 2013. You, it was already really clear. You know, it's like the hollowing out. So that uh, a hollowing out of cultural identity and, and loyalty in order to produce like an outer shell that's approved. Yes, of course, you can have an ethnic food, a dance, a dress. But the inside, the core, must be signified, ethnically signified, but also loyal to the Communist Party. You have the ideological angle. So it's not just an ethnic or racial assimilation. It's an ideological homogenization uh, along the the Chinese Communist Party ideology. That's a very important aspect as well. And I'm entirely out of time, and I thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Adrian, for again very uh, rich presentation from multiple point of views. Uh, my immediate thoughts are this is uh, generates a lot of questions for discussion for the signification of uh, Marxist ethnic policy. Obviously, what's being created here is supposed to look national in form, but being very uh, communist with Chinese characteristics in content. So anyway, uh, now we have time for questions. I would ask all the speakers to come uh, to the front. I think this will be probably the best way to operate it. And uh, while this is done, I would uh, first uh, take the liberty of asking uh, all of you uh, to briefly say in one or two sentences, what, is, what do you think is the uh, Communist Party of China trying to achieve in Xinjiang? Would you like to start, Adrian? Or with Uyghurs, in relation to Uyghurs? Joe, would you like to sit here, please? Okay. Yes. Yes, so to reiterate the goal, if we kind of go back to the words of Xi Jinping in 2014, of course, the goal is that 
as, we, as one of the pre other presenters also has mentioned, China's Belt and Road Initiative greatly increased the geopolitical significance of Xinjiang as a, as a region bordering eight Central Asian countries, uh, including Russia. And um, the need for stability, domestic stability, uh, which also un for Xi Jinping uh, politically has become even more important as the space for any diversity or dissent has uh, shrunk rapidly. So for China, uh, assimilating the Uyghurs both ethno-racially and ideologically is a matter of national security. And that really also, I think, explains why they will they persist in it, even if there is sanction, loss of face, diplomatic fallout, economic fallout, uh, etc., at least up to a point. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I agree with um, um, what Adrian has to say, um, in this, in, especially in the sense that this is, uh, I think, considered a, something of an existential question for the, um, the, the ruling party. Um, s stability is key to political legitimacy of, of in their in their perception the only way stability can be achieved is through a, a, a two-pronged effort to dilute the uh, Uyghur population and also Kazakhs and Kyrgyz and others uh, in Xinjiang and for those who aren't moved to other parts of northern Xinjiang interior of, uh, of China, or those who aren't prevented to be, uh, uh, those who aren't born, uh, to turn them as much as possible into on Chinese uh, culture. So dilute and um, uh, transform. But this is, this is merely a tool for the wider goal of promoting the party's legitimacy uh, through its ability to achieve uh, uh, stability for the Chinese nation. I haven't got much left to say. They've said everything I would have said more or less. But um, yeah, just to add that, you know, Xi Jinping came in in 2012, um, introducing a new era, a uh, Xin uh, Shidai, and uh, pursuing a China dream, a Zhongbo Meng. And the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, is a large part of that dream. Um, it needs to be um, achieved if Xi Jinping is to continue to enjoy political legitimacy, as, as both of my colleagues have said. Um, and I think that an awful lot of the things that we are hearing coming out of Xinjiang seem to center on humiliation of the Uyghur people. And I think, um, you know, in addition to the sort of concrete measures of population reduction and so on that we are hearing about, there is, there is also a very strong drive to humiliate and um, tame and destroy the spirit. Which people are brutalized and humiliated and, and um, you know, forced to, to give up everything dear to them and then to sort of pledge allegiance to, to the CCP. I think these are, these are all ways to um, to uh, destroy the Uyghur spirit, the national spirit, and, to, and, and all of these things that I was talking about, um, the cultural, cultural erasures, these are designed to um, castrate, if you like, the Uyghur identity, render it in a form that, that means that it can't, it can't self-sustain. Thank you. Questions from the audience, please. We have respected sinologists and China watchers here among our audience. Professor Lomova, please. Well, thank you for your presentation. Uh, as a person who doesn't do research on Xinjiang, but is, knows something about contemporary China, there is one thing that resonates for me in all these uh, efforts. And this is this kind of very simplistic scientism and the idea that new society can be scientifically built so that it will be a perfectly working machine um, in the service of, I don't, I don't dare to say so, humanity, you know, the, the 
the, the, the better people, the better people that will be uh, the result of this engineering. And certain, not so drastic, but certain efforts can be followed um, after 1949, even within the Han society. It is within the logic of a framework of creating better people suited for the future. And of course, according to the uh, template of the communist or I don't know whether you use the word communist, the communist party ideology uh, framework. Yeah, so this is one remark I would like to make. And then I have a question. Chinese culture is rather idiosyncratic. And now I talk about ordinary people, their habits, their everyday life. It's very special. And Chinese language, uh, by the way, <laughs> is really difficult for communication. Uh, because th there are so many idiosyncrasies within the language itself. Yeah. So how does it work in mixed villages? And the Chinese themselves are very conservative in terms of um, food and everyday habits and so on. How, how can it work within a mixed village when you have one Uyghur house, one Chinese house, and then they have their habits and the Chinese are of course in advantage because they are the, the model for the rest. Is it? workable this is my question can it work will, will they really i mean the uyghurs who are so different in mentality etc in um, I, and I, now i don't talk about religion i just talk about everyday life and values etc is it workable can they be cynicized can can somebody be cynicized because the chinese environment is so well as i said idiosyncratic Yes, it can be, it is workable and it can be achieved because of the sheer level of intimidation, fear that the Chinese Communist Party has now managed to create over the last four or five years in the region. The Uyghurs will now do anything at all. They will adopt any level of pretense in order to stay out of trouble, in order to keep their relatives out of trouble, in order to keep themselves and their loved ones out of the camps. Um, they don't have a choice. There is no path of resistance now. I, I wrote a lot about resistance back back you know, uh, 10 years ago, but that resistance, those methods of resistance are, are no longer an option in the current context. So, so I think, yes, it is workable, but it will be a pretense you know, on the part of the Uyghurs. They use chopsticks already. <laughs> They're very proficient with chopsticks. <laughs> I think probably a better question there is will they will they eventually eat pork? Um. You know, it's a performance for a lot of people right now, and uh, we didn't mention yet the program by which over a million uh, state employees have been sent at Han state employees have been sent to live in Uyghur homes to visit them on a monthly basis, basis and stay overnight for several days. Um, so that kind of monitoring can enforce a, uh, a, a performance. Uh, but um, right now in Xinjiang, uh, I think it's 49 percent, not uh, as of 2019, so it's probably higher now, uh, over 48, 49 percent of middle school children were in boarding schools. Um, so in many cases, this will be Uyghurs who are being raised and educated as as Han. So um, I think with a couple of generations, um, who knows whether they can maintain this kind of policy for that long. But I do think it would be possible across multiple generations. The model villages uh, at the moment, the ethnic unity villages are pilot project. Uh, they're not, they have not been rolled out on an extremely large scale. Um, it's one of the directions that this can take. Embedding can take different forms. So one of the ways to achieve this kind of population embedding is at a community level or village level. 
Uh, this can be in a village or in an urban setting. There's also urban model embedded communities. Um, you have also, there's, there's academic research articles on, on population embedding. You can have a, a more macro level embedding, which is when the Chinese uh, production, the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps, which is a Chinese settler colonial entity, um, they expand their sort of territories or uh, their um, farmlands, their cities, uh, which are uh, over, uh, between 50 and 95 percent Han Chinese. Um, and they have uh, been issued a command to expand their population. A uh, specific target is 300,000, bring in th 300,000 Han Chinese settlers by 2022. Uh, and the, the lowest level of embedding is what Ryan just mentioned, the family level embedding, meaning you actually have the government officials who live, eat, sleep and work with the Uyghurs, Uyghur families for a certain amount of time every year. Um, I agree with the other two speakers that over time a degree of assimilation is possible, but I'm very skeptical. I, I, I might align with you in the sense that I think the human spirit tends to have developed a very interesting sort of inner resistance against this sort of assimilation. So I think even with the younger generation, there's, because the problem is that the Chinese often actually reject, there is discrimination, which you didn't say that, but I think we can, I, we can kind of agree on it, right? There is actually, it could be more overt, more covert, more between the lines. There's always some level of you're different actually. And that by itself actually creates that ethnic boundary or artificially upholds it. Even we have heard of examples of Uyghurs who thought, who tried to really integrate and succeed in Chinese culture. So I think there are significant risks and open questions surrounding the assimilation strategy. Very, very major. Even though, yes, the surface pretense is, is near perfect now. Uh, yes, thank you uh, for, the, uh, for the talks. Um, I would like to get to the issue of the Belt and Road. I mean, you mentioned it several times and also yesterday it came to uh, the discussion and actually it seems to be obvious yeah, Xinjiang is there at the gate uh, towards the world. But uh, how exactly uh, does this help to, uh, to promote the Belt and Road initiative or to, to actually um, to, to make it happen? Because I totally agree with you that there is uh, being uh, that there is the processing like this destruction of the spirit of the people, their 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 identity. But uh, how is this connected with the uh, with the Belton Road? Because the Belton Road is about access, about uh, connection, and uh, the Uyghurs and other Muslims are sort of like claimed to be those could actually help and enhance this uh, sort of access even if they would if it would not be them to do this uh, what possibly could they do to harm the Belt and Road Initiative with all the infrastructure China has there with all the military China has there so how could you justify the things that are happening by Belt and Road? I think that I'm trying to view this from the <coughs> I'm trying to view this from the government's perspective. I'm not saying that Uyghurs would or could do this, but I think viewed from the government, through the government's eyes, I imagine there it was a fear that as as China attempted to build out the Belt, the Belt and Road Initiative with all of the related infrastructure projects that, that entails from from the northwestern region, that we some Uyghurs who were politically antagonistic to the state might attempt to sabotage some of those efforts and we saw this already back in the 1990s there were there were a series of sabotage uh, incidents where Uyghurs were um, blowing up for example power lines or, or trying to disrupt the building of railways all of the infrastructure that was being built up in the 1990s that would bring more Han settlers into the region the Uyghurs who were antagonistic to the state at that time were attacking the infrastructure you can't call this terrorism because this was this was attacks on structures, not not on not on innocent civilians. So it wasn't terrorism, even though the state might call it so now. Um, but there is a history of that happening in the region. So I think that's possibly uh, that the government feared that that local Uyghurs might attack their efforts. 
also in the context that so far the Uyghurs haven't been involved in the Belt and Road Initiative at all. So you very often see big posters. When I was there in 2018 last time, you saw some big billboards about Belt and Road Initiative um, with slogans in Chinese or in English and no Uyghur. So it's almost as if the Belt and Road Initiative is happening despite the presence of the Uyghurs. There didn't seem to me to be any possibility for the Uyghurs to benefit from it or be involved in it or to Um, there are not a lot of issues um, around which you can find a big divide among scholars who specialize on, uh, on, on Xinjiang or Eastern Turkestan. Um, but I think this is one of them. There are quite a few people who say that the Belt and Road is an uh, important sort of causal factor. Um, I'm, I'm not in that camp. I think the Belt and Road, while not entirely insignificant is really far down on the list of reasons why this is happening. Uh, the Belt and Road has no serious presence in Tibet, for example, and we see a lot of similar, just slightly less extreme um, versions of this stuff going on in Tibet. Um, so I think this is more about um, the turn toward nationalism, the sense that ethnic difference is a threat to security and to the, you know, the future greatness of a, of a, of a, 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 a Zhonghua race that is very much based on the Han. I think you also should, I think we need to look at the image perspective. So meaning that if there's even just one or two terrorist attacks in Xinjiang, even if they may not hit any significant infrastructure, I think for President Xi Jinping and the Belt and Road being his signature initiative, it's, it's, there's a lot about face, a lot about projecting stability. And so I think this sort, of, this, um, so this sort of surface projection level, I think, is significant. Also, the Chinese tend to be very, um, if there's some instability or attack in the region, the Chinese will very quickly stay away from it, and they will expect others to do the same. So Xinjiang is supposed to be like this. As you say, it's supposed to be all about mobility. But then again, I think the measures we see, are many of them were uh, short term, like mass internment or police checkpoints everywhere. This was a short term strategy. We now have reports in 2021, even in late 2020, about the massive reduction in police checkpoints, invisible police presence, even though the fear, the police state still lives on. So I think we can say that this tried to create an environment where uh, the, the, the sort of political or national safety of, of this region was being secured through a draconian measures, many of which are now being uh, scaled back. Thank you very much for your research and, and presentations. Uh, I would like to ask maybe one follow-up follow question to Professor Lomova. I would like to know if in this process of sinization are the Chinese Han chosen or a uh, who are these good people without the uh, criminal or like or, or like Professor Zenz mentioned? Who are these people, and if there is any process or found any research that was done on this? Who are these Han who are moved or Xinjiang sensation? Settlers come to, or they are selected, how they are. There is a process. These people are just curious. It's some. and in the police forces and security, but of course also to bring Han Chinese settlers to farm land. And the criteria are like really, really low. Uh, like there's no criteria. They're offering free education, free income, free land, free housing, free money, bonuses, uh, a lot of money uh, to attract, because it's not very attractive for the Han. Uh, so also anecdotally, I mean, both if you look at some of the criteria uh, for hiring, 
and at what I have heard anecdotally, um, the Han who are being attracted are actually quite low level, like uh, if, if one can put it this way. Uh, they're not very educated or well behaved. Of course, they typically wouldn't. I mean, they would they would not accept any, I'm sure, who have like a criminal background. But of course, most Han don't have a criminal background. Record. So I think the criteria are quite low. Any Han is, 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 is 100 times better than a Uyghur. So on the scale, it's very easy to be a good Han on the scale. Uh, and for Uyghurs, it's almost impossible to be a good population optimizer. So it's very, it's very, I think, along ethno-racial uh, lines. I, I can just add one little data point to that that I that uh, backs that up. It's a 2018 um, Department of Education report about uh, uh, teacher recruitment, and it it states a goal of increasing the number of Han teachers, so bringing them from outside into Xinjiang. And it gives a hierarchy of what qualifications they should have. And number one is political quality. Number two is um, ability to teach standard Chinese. And then everything after that is. Yeah, I was going to say that um, just to build on what, what Ryan said there. Um, when when I was there in 2018, um, a lot of Uyghurs were complaining to me about the complete lack of teaching qualifications of the Han that were being brought into the region to teach to teach Chinese. So not only are they being forced to learn a, a second language, they're being forced to learn a second language with a person who has no teaching qualifications. Uh, and in one case, um, the example given was that um, the, the, the woman who had, the Han woman who had been selected to teach uh, my, my respondents children um, turned out to be a woman who had been working in, in, a, in a Han massage parlor which essentially doubles, doubles as, as, a, as, a, as a brothel uh, most of the time in most parts of China. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I have a question for to Adrian Vance uh, about masculine. So you assume, assume that there is no masculine in Xinjiang, but can we uh, be sure of that? Uh, I especially rem remember the um, uh, presentation of, uh, of uh, Ethan Gutman during the first meeting of the European Union. He mentioned a um, large scale crematorium in Singapore. So I wonder whether it's possible and what about um, organ harvesting that might be a, a way of. Um, yes, thank you. So, um, that we have is anecdotal evidence of higher mortality in the camps. We have data points both from Uyghurs in exile who have relatives who have heard, for example, a relative was released from a camp and then died soon after, died at home. Um, didn't make it for very long. We, of course, have some witness testimony, uh, some very dramatic witness testimony. Uh, of some of the conditions uh, who said that, uh, you know, uh, several died, G uh, people saw people die um, due to the conditions. Although by no means that's all of the testimony. Um, it's quite clear that the conditions in different internment facilities can differ greatly. Uh, some conditions seem to be very terrible. Uh, in other places, it seems to be much more, uh, sort of, much more what we would expect uh, expect just from like psychological brainwashing. Um, yes, we crematoria have been built also near internment camps in some cases. The problem is that that's, there's a quite a bit of inference going on um, because crematoria are being built in all of China. There's even a national goal to achieve like a hundred, nearly 100% cremation by 2020. Um, part of that is to eliminate re uh, religious rites uh, for a funeral funeral rights. Uh, part of that is for sanitary or space reasons. Although in Xinjiang, I would ex not expect it to be there for space reasons. And especially if we know what happened to Uyghur cemeteries. Uh, but there's a lot of inference. And of course, if somebody uh, dies in internment camp, you don't want to have like the relatives examine, well, what does their body look like? What, what can we see any marks or evidence of torture or abuse? 
there would be an obvious reason. Um, I, I would certainly expect a higher mortality, uh, but we really just don't have, we just, it, as, as academics, we prefer to be conservative and somewhat cautious. But if you say, can we exclude the possibility of mass murder, uh, of course we can't exclude it. But I think if there was a huge amount of mass murder with today's satellite, etc., I think we would have more data points than we do. Yeah, including we have a, a pretty good uh, systematic, well, not entirely systematic, but uh, really large in scale collection of um, testimonies from family members at the uh, shahid.biz Xinjiang victims database. Uh, which now has, what, 20,000 entries or something like that? Uh, entries for 20,000, 14,000? Uh, 14,000 individuals. Um, and the number of reports of, of deaths is small. Uh, it would turn up. It would, it would turn up there, I think. Same time, I think um, from uh, various sources such as eyewitnesses, it's clear that uh, killings uh, do happen in uh, cases of demonstrations or violent or uh, peaceful protests which turn into mass violence, such as the case we, we referenced, the Ilish coup violence, so, which according to some uh, witnesses uh, wo took, wo created or took about uh, two to three thousand lives, I think we, we mentioned the number this is our this is article published for example by radio free asia etc so uh, eyewitnesses which uh, describe uh, uh, violent incidents which have taken place in xinjiang do uh, f often uh, contain statements that the police has killed civilians who were unarmed and peacefully protesting so there is anecdotal evidence which is practically impossible to verify but uh, things like this do happen. stationed in, in Xinjiang and that that driver had um, broken down in conversation with the Uyghur I, no way of verifying this obviously but the the taxi driver had broken down in the conversation with the Uyghur and had confessed to going with his with his um, unit into a village in, in Yaken um, in South Xinjiang and I'm assuming I'm, I was thinking that this was pro almost certainly describing what happened in, in Yaken what we think happened in Yaken uh, and saying to the Uyghur, I'm, I'm so sorry, um, I, feel, I, I feel so much regret and, and I, I can't live with myself since this happened, but my unit went into this village and when we came out of this village, not a single soul was standing. So there's one anecdotal piece of, of evidence right there, but we have absolutely no way of knowing um, the, the truth of this, this piece of evidence. These sort of things would not I think as likely have happened more recently. So yes, I, I certainly, there certainly I think is evidence of possible mass atrocity of this kind before 2017. But I think the recent phase since 2017 has been characterized by a high amount of government control where I don't uh, sort of these large scale resistance and then state reaction by killing whole swaths, you know, uh, would I think have been significantly less likely in the last four years. But yes, yes, of course, that those are possible examples of mass killing. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for for these fascinating fascinating uh, presentations. Uh, I I would like to ask about uh, the, the possible policy options that the outside world might have to actually do something about this. Adrian mentioned that uh, the, the UN Convention Against Prevention of uh, Genocide never really prevented a single genocide because, uh, you know, by definition, it's sort of hard to prevent a crime before 
before it uh, happens and before you have the evidence. But even, even perhaps uh, more importantly, this kind of uh, mass, mass repression is, seems to be quite different from previous instances of, uh, of state terror, right? Like you, you had the concentration camps, which clearly were aimed at uh, annihilation of the, of the population, you had the gulag, where the extermination may not have been the purpose, uh, uh, but rather sheer punishment. But here in this case, you actually have a new purpose, it seems, um, a, a re-engineering of, uh, of a human being. So how, how, you know, what, do you, what, what can the outside world do against something like that? Than the usual um, suggestions. Um, I, one of the recommendations I made to the, the, the UK um, Foreign Affairs Committee December, last December, uh, in their call for evidence about the internment camps, one of the recommendations I made was was that they look at um, providing funding for the preservation of Uyghur language and Uyghur culture within the UK um, for the diaspora community, and look at creating uh, or building up, building on with Uyghur studies departments and Uyghur language departments onto existing Central Asian studies departments. Um, in universities. Since then, I think, I, 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 especially since attending a conference in Paris last week, um, looking at the, the sort of attempts of the diaspora to sort of hold on to Uyghur culture and language and preserve it and maintain it and sustain it, I'm now thinking actually that that recommendation was slight, slightly pitched too high. I, I think what we need, what we need is, is state funding for primary school education for, 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 you know, for dedicated Uyghur language Sunday schools or something like that for the diaspora communities in different countries around the world. I think it's going to be very, very hard to influence what China does in the region, but we can at least try to try to achieve some positive support outside of the region. So just a little bit different to what. Um, I think we were all slow to reach for the microphone because none of us are uh, political scientists or foreign policy type uh, people, but we've kind of been forced into that role uh, pretty pretty often over the last three years um, because uh, we give presentations on this topic. Um, uh, to me, I, I think it's unlikely that the, that the leadership can be convinced by, um, by argument and discussion with Chinese leadership. Um, I think the only option is the imposition of costs and that um, uh, would be most effective if it were coming from more than just the rich world. Um, uh, and I think, you know, a lot of people balk at the imposition of costs, whether it's um, uh, sanctions or formal denunciations, as, as ineffective um, and even potentially um, counterproductive. Um, but for whatever it's worth, as a someone who is entirely inexpert at these <laughs> questions, I'm a historian. Um, it seems to me that the, that the Chinese state has a cost-benefit analysis for this policy, and we don't have access to, to their sense of what the costs are versus what the benefits are. Um, and um, the one thing in the, in, in the power of the of people outside of China is to add to the cost side of the scale. And until that scale tips, it will look useless, and it may never tip or it may simply prevent things from getting worse. Uh, but personally, I, I think that um, adding costs, whether it be boycotts, which individuals can undertake uh, reputational damage, um, uh, I think that's, that's, that's the only really possibly effective option. I would add to this, I think we have evidence that the Chinese government considers this a matter of national security and is therefore willing to incur a very significant cost. However, if we don't do anything, if we don't add to the cost, the danger is not only that nothing changes within China, but that things change without, uh, outside of China, I mean, meaning that um, if there's no cost, no resistance, other authoritarians might look to uh, the Xinjiang model as a model to emulate, to suppress their ethnic groups, and then China will happily export the technology. Um, uh, so I think 
even for ourselves, for the global community, oftentimes it's just necessary to do the right thing. If there's forced labor, you don't buy it, you put laws against it, you just do the right thing. China then says, oh, we just shift supply chains, we sell more domestically. Yes, but I think there's always some kind of effect and doing what is right, which I think also includes uh, some diplomatic sanctions on relation to the Olympics, um, does enact a cost. And as Ryan said, we may not see it un un until it tips, but, but even this, in these less than visible effects, I think, are significant and often doing the right thing actually accumulates over time and has some sort of long-term effect or even sooner than we think. We think back uh, World War II, right? Um, doing or not doing, uh, even small things that were sometimes done by people, even individuals, can be significant. Even civil society if effort, even if governments don't do something, even civil society, even awareness, uh, even us learning from this, even people saying, okay, this technology makes this possible and this ruthless ideology, um, I think this all really adds up to something significant. And so I think some of the most effective things uh, I think that can be done is to have provisions against forced labor and ch the changing of supply chains. And that has to happen at the legal government level, not just expecting companies to do the right thing, because companies exist to make money and survive financially. That's why they exist. And so I think this really has to be done at government levels. And that's uh, the forced labor situation and consumer action is one of the best uh, and most effective things that can be done. Besides, however, also I think necessary di diplomatic action uh, at the United Nations or in relation to the Olympics. Okay, now I would like to just ask something a little bit more concrete that, that all these, uh, these big and important things. But uh, it's back to, to what uh, Joe was talking about, about the changes of things in the, in the education system. Um, so uh, how exactly does it work now with the introduction of, of more uh, Chinese and uh, Chinese media education? Uh, if I just think about back on, on the Tibetan areas, uh, there's the same, same things going on. Uh, but for example, uh, there's still some schools that do teach the majority of the um, subjects in Uyghur or not at all. And then you saw, uh, you showed the, the picture with this kind of Uyghur script. So uh, do they still teach Uyghur script in the Uyghur language lessons or how? Or is it like just on the outside it's cut off but in at school you can still use it or how it would this work and then uh, in tibet like uh, lately it's i don't know it's back like some years they started again to reinvent this this type which was in the 50s that they would take the classes out of the autonomous regions and bring them to the mainland china like the lowland china where we call it uh to to to, to be there the entire class would be at this chinese han school uh, for the whole term, uh, learning there in the Han environment and then just being brought back after a semester or two. So do you see this in Xinjiang as well? Um, thank you for engaging the presentation. Yeah. Um, so, far as, so far as we know, um, as a vehicle to um, to um, communicate this this sort of um, to communicate the Han culture and, and the Han idea and the Chinese political ideology. Um, in some places there there appears to be no Uyghur medium education at all, according to the last scholar that we had in the region um, uh, who was investigating this. Um, if you compare the national language education now, which is Chinese only education with the, bi the bilingual education that was there before. Um, there was lots of evidence that when we had the bilingual education policy, lots of weak children, like the little boy I showed you there, um, were able were able to um, were able to um, do very well and um, 
actually not like the people I showed you there. Sorry, he, he's he's different. But um, if you go, if you get slightly older children than him, um, those children were were doing very well in, in sort of growing up as bilingual and in some cases trilingual um, individuals. So especially in the regional capital of Rumchi, you would often come across in the, in the twenty tens, two thousands, two thousands twenty early twenty tens, you would still come across uh, Uyghur children who were trilingual and, and growing up with a very good command of languages. But in the last few years, um, we're, we're having reports of Uyghur children becoming very cowed, very intimidated at, at Chinese only, Chinese medium schools, um, being very afraid to speak, being, being um, forbidden to speak in Uyghur at all, being punished if they are spoke, if they do speak in Uyghur, uh, but then not having the Chinese language skills to be able to speak or write well in Chinese, and then actually in the end choosing not to speak at all. And just having silent in the classroom. Um, so, and in terms of what you said about I think my boarding schools going away to, is that what you meant? Sort of consolidation of, oh, the Xinjiang ban. Yeah, the, Xin, the Xinjiang ban, I, I'm not quite, I, I haven't seen any recent data on the Xinjiang ban, but if we look at, um, if, at slightly earlier data on the Xinjiang ban, um, for example, from Timothy Brosit's book, uh, and various articles we have on the Xinjiang ban. These are the classes in, in, chi in inner China where you know, a, the Uyghur students were selected and sent away for uh, yeah, higher education. Um, but what we're seeing, the results of that, of that experience, um, we're seeing that the Uyghurs are coming out of the Xinjiang ban in inner China and many of them are reaching for religion and trying to refine their culture. This is what Tim, Tim found in, in, in his book, that actually actually being forced to adopt wholesale Chinese culture was actually pushing Uyghurs who might not have looked for religion otherwise, who might have remained quite secular, pushing them to go and investigate the mosque and going to explore at the mosque and, and begin, beginning to wear headscarves and so on. Um, and, and so actually pushing them back in the opposite direction. Again, it's like this, you know, the coercion is, is, is having the opposite effect of, of, of um, actually pushing people back towards their own culture. I believe, uh, I don't have the data in my mind, but I believe the, uh, the Xinjiang ban, the inland school, uh, c is continually expanded in numbers, continues to increase. And the other trend is to um, uh, make preschool mandatory. So you have like in, in Qinghai, for example, you have this like uh, 15 years free education or uh, depending how many years, if it includes high school or middle school. And so the trend is to make preschool available and mandatory and then to make middle and high school so not, uh, sorry, not middle school is already mandatory, but to also uh, really push for the transition because they, they consider students who drop out of the education system after middle school are considered a threat. Um, so they're really moving into either vocational education after middle school or high schooling, and they're giving 50 extra points to anybody from Southern Xinjiang, regardless of ethnicity, uh, to promote them for a university entrance examination. So they're pushing all of these on all channels, both the inland schools in, in, in Eastern China, university, anything but stop, drop out, and go back to the countryside or, or go back to the village because that's considered to be a, a threat, the unemployed young. So our time is up. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, thanks of all to the audience for coming. Thank you all the speakers also for making time to come to Prague and uh, take part in this discussion and also on the, in the other all related activities. It was a great pleasure to have you here and to learn so much about uh, the situation in a part of China which tells so much about uh, the People's Republic of China and the direction things are going particularly relevant, for example, today as the sixth plenum is being concluded and uh, passing the a new renewed resolution on the history of the party. Uh, another, I would like to alert our Czech audience to the publication of a book uh, published by, it's a prison memoir by uh, 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 Mrs. Gilbehar Khativaji, uh, who spent uh, around a year in a pre-education camp in a detention facility in China. Her memoir has just recently been published in Czech language. You can buy it and read it. It's very revealing about the situation and the practices in Xinjiang. It's called Přežila Semčínský Gulag, 
vyšlo v nakladatelství Lipka Publishers, nedávno velmi doporučuji k přečtení, v, jak z hlediska obsahu, tak z hlediska překladu. Uh, thank you everyone for coming once again. Thank you.